There we go. Here, I'll go ahead and start. Hi, this is uh, Christian Knudsen. You've joined uh, EMS Medicine Live for our October 2016 uh, session. <laughs> and as he's talking, there we go. Uh, I've kind of given up the uh, the preamble slides this month. Uh, I think if you watched enough times, you you kind of know we are here to uh, share EMS information with both academic EMS fellows and kind of community EMS physicians. Um, and uh, we're approaching the end of our second year of uh, broad monthly broadcasts, which is exciting. Uh, this month we have Brian Clemency uh, from the University at Buffalo, uh, who's going to be presenting. Uh, Brian has a long list of accomplishments. He's the EMS Fellowship Director out in Buffalo, um, and uh, we're fortunate to have him today. Yeah. Uh, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. Um, so today what we're going to do is we're going to go over the 2014 EMS LLSA articles. I think this is important for fellows to know because this really is uh, an important piece of our sort of compendium of EMS articles as part of our core body of knowledge that we keep talking about now that we're a real subspecialty. Um, the 2014 um, uh, LLSA was presented at NEMSP. Um, a couple years ago, and then this year in New Orleans, we're going to present the 2016 LLSA articles, and so we'll do a plug for that and invite anybody um, who is around, whether you're board certified or not, uh, to join us in New Orleans. We're going to try to get through all of these articles in about an hour. You really can't do these articles justice in that short a period of time, but instead my goal is just to sort of whet your appetite for each of these. I think uh, fellows should have a passing uh, knowledge of all of these studies um, and be able to know the kind of the take-home points and be prepared if uh, their providers ask them questions about these articles. Um, and then hopefully after you hear this today, one or two of them will um, excite you or intrigue you and lead you to read the full article associated with it. Because um, we're just going to do a, a kind of an overview touching on e each of these. Uh, the slides that I'm going to present today was a team effort. It was created by Dr. McCoy and Dr. Frischi, um, who were my co-presenters when we presented this in New Orleans a few years ago. Uh, Dr. McCoy is a show-off. He has got um, a disclosure. Uh, the rest of us do not. So originally when we presented this in New Orleans, we did each article in about six to seven minutes. Today we're going to do them in four or less. We're going to talk about some of the methods, results, and conclusions of each of the study. and discuss some of the important study limitations. And if you are board certified and you have not taken the LLSA, I think this PowerPoint presentation will prepare you well uh, to take it if you choose to do so uh, based on these slides. We're gonna keep going back to this slide just so you know where you are. This is kind of our roadmap for the day showing each of the studies that we're gonna do. So let's just start with the first. The first study comes to us from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's intermuscular versus intravenous therapy for pre-hospital status epilepticus. This is part of the Rampart study, which is by far the coolest name in all of EMS research. And if you're a young fellow and don't know why, then that's just sad for all of us. Um, the study is rapid anticonvulsant medication prior to arrival trial. This was a huge complex study. It included over 4,000 medics and over 30 EMS agencies and it was done under exception from informed consent. It was really hard to give a written consent form to someone who is actively seizing at the time. Yes. Um, the background, prior to the study, you know, many of us thought that IV Ativan was the best way to go. Lots of us in the hospital uh, use IV Ativan as our first line. However, there's storage challenges associated with Ativan, and IV access may not always be possible in every patient. This was a non-inferiority trial. It was designed as double-blinded, randomized control for the treatment of status epilepticus, which was defined as seizure activity for greater than five minutes and still going on when EMS arrived. This was a blinded study, so that providers gave each patient both an IV dose and an IM medication. If they were in the IM group, they received IM drug and an IV placebo. If they're in the IV group, they got IV drug and then an IM placebo. And then rescue meds were done by local protocol if the patient continued to seize. The outcomes they were looking for was, was the patient still seizing when they arrived at the hospital or were rescue medications needed? And in the end, there were almost 900 patients in the total analysis. Treatment was successful 
in 73% of patients in the IM group, midazolam group, and 63% of patients in the IV Ativan group. This gives us a very stiff, statistically significant p-value of less than 0.01 when they ran this both as a non-inferiority and then when they re-ran it as a superiority trial. Here were some of the secondary outcomes. There was less hospitalization and less ICU admissions in the IM midazolam group. The other secondary outcomes were similar, as well as length of stay if you were hospitalized and length of stay in the ICU if you were put in the ICU was also similar. And this just shows time from when they decided to give the meds and open the box to ending the seizure. Not surprisingly, it took more time to get an IV medication to the person than an IM medication. Um, and so if you can show that the IM group was less likely to be seizing on arrival in the ED than the IV group, and IM is easier and faster, then probably that's the right answer. In the entire study, about a quarter of the patients were refractory, uh, had, um, were refractory to the seizure medicines, and the conclusion of the study was that IM may be a simpler, faster route of treatment. So I absolutely love this next study. Uh, this next study comes to us from Toronto. I talk about Dr. Verbeek's study almost any time I have a group of 20 or more paramedics around me. Uh, Dr. Verbeek is not um, EM boarded by ABEM because he's a Canadian physician, but he wandered into our LLSA presentation two years ago, having no idea that his article had been picked for the LLSA and was totally tickled that it was being covered. We've all seen patients with dynamic EKGs in the emergency department and tracings that are seemingly normal. And then either the chest pain changes or the patient's condition changes and all of a sudden they have huge tombstones or dynamic changes. And so we know the importance of doing multiple ECGs over time to get a clear picture of what's going on with the patient and to capture what may be dynamic changes. The AHA recommends serial ECGs in the emergency department if there is suspicion but there was no clear pre-hospital guidelines for actually how to do this. Here's what they did in Toronto. For patients with symptoms concerning for ACS, they performed a first 12 lead at patient contact. If that was normal, they would do a second one prior to leaving the scene once they got the patient in the ambulance. And then if that was normal, they would do a third if symptoms were concerning as they were getting ready to pull into the receiving hospital. The researchers did a retrospective chart review of Toronto's uh, two-tiered third service system over a one-year period. And their goal was to know how many, and they called them lost opportunities, would there be if providers only performed a single ECG. Here's what they found. During the one-year period, there were 325 code STEMIs. These were STEMI activations initiated from the field. 85% of them were identified on the first ECG, but then another 30 were caught on the second and another 20 on the third to get them to 100% of all the STEMI activations. So if they only did a single ECG, there would have been 15% fewer or absolute number of 50 less of these code STEMIs. Now, a limitation of the study is they didn't look afterwards and actually see how the patients turned out. They don't know what the cath report show. Um, they don't know if these were false activations or not, but clearly there were additional cases where they were able to identify patients with potential STEMIs. So the take home point, and this is directly from the study itself is, we suggest that an EMS system relying on acquisition of a single pre-hospital ECG are subject to potential missed opportunities to identify cases of pre-hospital STEMI. Multiple ECGs may improve sensitivity of evolving STEMI, and it definitely increased the number of STEMI alerts, although this study was unable to determine specifically um, its sensitivity or specificity for true STEMIs. Moving along, two down, a bunch to go. So this is HEMS versus GEMS, the association between helicopter and ground emergency medical services and survival for adults with major trauma. And major trauma is a key part of this study. We know that HEMS is often used to transport the most critically ill patient to the most appropriate facility, but we also know that it's costly um, and it may not be needed for everybody. Here's what they did. They looked at the National Trauma Data Bank for 2007-2009 they looked at transports either by ground or by air to level one or two trauma centers, 
age greater than 15, that's the cutoff that the American College of Surgeons uses to determine who needs to go to a pediatric versus adult uh, center, and patients with an ISS of greater than 15. So these were sick patients with high uh, injury severity scores, and then you can see some of the regression variables they looked at. The endpoint was survival to hospital discharge. And again, I've said it twice now, but I think the fact that they looked at only patients with ISS is greater than 15 is so important. I think the key is this focused on sick patients. I don't think anybody questions the role of HEMS for sick patients who are far away from trauma centers, um, but I still personally get some angst when we have um, transports that we look at that don't come from far away or that have perhaps less sick patients. And I think that is a different study not addressed here. Overall in the data bank, they had 223,000 patients, many, many exclusions. For instance, almost 900,000 patients were excluded because their dispo or transportation type was unknown. In the end, in the final analysis, um, they had 200 and 223,000 patients, like we said, after all those other exclusions. Um, also, about 500,000 patients were excluded because they had a low ISS. Overall, mortality was 12.6% in the air group and 11% in the ground group. However, the people going by air were much sicker. So you do have to do a multivariable analysis to really know uh, the effect. Once you did that, the odds ratio becomes uh, favorable to air transportation. So what are the take-home points? Obviously, this is a retrospective look at a database. Um, there were some issues with imputing for missing variables and lots of cases that were excluded. This is potentially a convenience sample. However, for the various analysis that took into account patient severity, it showed a similar result, better outcome for patients who were transported by HEMS. Um, so I think that's a take home point to this study. Remember sick trauma patients, they require definitive surgical care. And so we need to get them to hospitals that are capable of doing it. And I think HEMS is a good way to move sick patients from far away uh, to trauma centers. So one of the benefits of HEMS is potentially reduced transport times. And when we talk about speed associated with EMS, one of the things that always haunts us is the issue of response times. This is emergency medical services times and mortality in an urban setting. You know, the eight minute response time is either the holy grail of EMS or potentially the worst things ever happened to EMS. And I'm sure many of you have been in meetings where um, different uh, community leaders or stakeholders bemoaned responses. You know, if you're there in 759, you're a hero. If you're there in 801, it's the worst thing ever. Um, and so this study looked at dichotomizing responses into faster than eight minutes and slower than eight minutes and seeing if there was in fact outcome differences. Many of you know this eight minute response time thing that has plagued our, our profession and industry came originally from Eisenberg's 1979 study. It found that intervals of four minutes to CPR and eight minutes to defibrillation maximized survival in cardiac arrest patients. And this became the basis of response time goals for many things beyond cardiac arrest, right? The goal of this study was to determine if EMS response time affects survival, again, using that eight minute cutoff. Here's what their study design was. They looked at nearly 8,000 patients with ALS responses linked to ED and inpatient records. It was a one-year retrospective study of a single system looking at only echo and delta MPDS determinants, so the sickest patients. Again, we looked at cases where responses were linked to ED records. So if there was a fast or slow response time that did not end up being a transport, for instance, a cardiac arrest that was run on scene, that patient was excluded from the analysis. And the primary outcome they looked at was all-cause mortality at hospital discharge. It should also be said this was an urban system. Let's look at mortality by response time. Uh, for responses less than eight minutes, uh, the mortality was 6.4%. For greater than eight minutes, it was 7.1%. This led to an unadjusted difference of 0.7% with a confidence interval that crossed over one. The odds ratio after adjustment for age, gender, scene, transport times, et cetera, was 1.19. 
uh, with a confidence interval that crossed over one, so it was not statistically significant. I love this last graph. So if you take a look at this, this is response time and, mort and mortality broken down by each individual one minute segment. And I think the take home message from this slide is, if you're approaching an eight minute response and you're about to miss your time compliance, I think the best thing you can do is drive around the block two more times with your lights off. Because if you can get there in 10 minutes instead, the patient's likelihood of dying is considerably reduced. So you've missed your time compliance, but at least you saved your patient. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, the take home points, there was no difference in mortality at the eight minute response time, no adjusted difference in mortality at four minutes or nine minutes either in secondary analysis. And they found that response time when divided into before eight minutes and after eight minutes was not associated with all cause mortality. So if getting there faster maybe doesn't matter, does it matter if you bring ALS or BLS care to the scene of the call? That was the focus of this next study. This is from resuscitation. This is advanced life support versus basic life support in the pre-hospital setting of meta-analysis. Or as I like to call this study, does any of this crap really matter anyway? They performed a meta-analysis of studies comparing ALS to BLS care. They include multiple different types of study design, and they did do a pretty good job of considering the risk of bias associated with the individual studies. The outcomes they looked at were survival to hospital discharge as a primary outcome, and secondarily, in some studies, they looked at survival at hospital admission. So when we talk about ALS versus BLS care and mortality, I think the first thing we need to do is break it down into trauma and not trauma, and that's what the authors did correctly. This takes a look at their screening process. They screened over a thousand articles before making their way down to 18 articles comparing ALS versus BLS, evenly split between trauma patients and non-traumatic cardiac arrest patients. Here's what they found for trauma patients. There were nine trials and nearly 17,000 patients. They found that the BLS-only mortality was 18% versus ALS mortality of 29% with an odds ratio of 0 0.658. In almost all studies, it was thought that survival was potentially improved due to trauma severity, like perhaps if you had a ALS and a BLS crew both on scene and two patients, you might give the sicker one to the ALS crew, potentially. Time spent on scene uh, for procedures and whatnot was also clear. As you can see, most of these studies um, were to the right of uh, the meta-analysis sort of dotted line combining all the studies with a single very large study that Lieberman performed that accounted for more than half of all the patients in the overall um, meta-analysis. However, they did do a leave one out sensitive analysis sort of saying what would the data look like without that data point and it still had the same answer. For non-traumatic cardiac arrest, there were nine studies, again, nearly 8,000 patients. This found that ALS was associated with a nearly 50% increase in survival. So presumably, BLS uh, was better for non, it was better for trauma, and ALS was better for, um, for cardiac arrest not due to trauma. This had an odds ratio of 1.468, which favored ALS care. And in this study, 20% of all patients had ROSC, which is different than survival to hospital discharge. And they did various subgroup analysis looking at this also. So, in total, for trauma, ALS was associated with a one-third lower survival to hospital discharge. And again, this may be due to trauma severity, and it may be due to time uh, spent on scene, although this, this meta-analysis could not specifically examine uh, duration of on-scene time. For non-trauma cardiac arrest, ALS was associated with a 50% higher survival to hospital discharge. Uh, for the studies that looked at ALS performed by a physician, it was associated with a two-fold increase in survival. And ALS was associated with increased survival at hospital admission, um, although not all studies um, had that endpoint in them. It was limited because there's not that many uh, well-run con randomized controlled trials of this, really none, so all they can look at is other kinds of trials. Most of the trials were before and after type, and there's lots of bias inherent in that. Um, and there are likely other co-founders which were partially addressed by the regression analysis, but may still be an issue. Take-home points, ALS wasn't better for trauma patients. 
ALS was better for non-trauma patients, and when that ALS came in the form of a physician, it was much better for non-trauma patients. And I think this is important because it really gets back to BLS care and timely transport for our traumatic patients. Um, I think we're moving away from hopefully once and for all any kind of ideas about staying and playing with these trauma patients. We know that aggressive IV fluid management is not important. So we really, when we've got somebody who is critically injured from trauma, we really want to get them going, whether that be by ground or by air. We don't want to uh, dawdle on scene. So let's look next at root cause of errors in pediatric emergencies. This is from uh, Lammers et al., published a couple years ago. So we know that even the most seasoned physician or seasoned field provider uh, can at times uh, lose their crap when they see a pediatric patient that's sick. We just don't treat that many pediatric patients. And there's a number of issues associated with using different kinds of equipment and using weight-based dosing that may take us all out of our comfort zone at times. So this study wanted to take a look at how providers do with those less frequently used skills which are at risk for deterioration. This is a slide that may look out of place and whenever you see a slide that looks out of place in an LLSA lecture, you should think, hmm, they must have put that there for a reason. So if you're taking your test, let this soak in for a moment. Here's our methods they used. They did both quantitative and qualitative analysis. They looked at on-duty EMS crews and they had this really sweet sounding mobile simulation center. It was a 24 foot long trailer. It had a control room in it, a simulated child's room, and a simulated ambulance. And they pulled on duty crews in, and the on duty crews used the, their own equipment from the ambulance, which I think was really important also, right? This was their bags, which were either stocked correctly or not, stocked the way they like to stock their bags, as opposed to the researchers just giving them this simulated equipment to use. The simulation they used um, was a, a standard scenario of a six-month-old who had a TBI uh, due to non-accidental trauma. That patient presented with altered mental status and then seizure and then ultimately respiratory arrest. They had 45 simulations and 90 subjects because they had two subjects for each simulation in a pair. Crews completed an average of 47 out of 67 of these scoreable items and the error rates um, for the different medications are shown there. The authors point out a number of what they perceive to be major quality issues um, as part of their qualitative analysis. So oxygen delivery, for instance. Some crews didn't bring their oxygen tank in and as such were not able to give oxygen. Others did not have or did not use an OPA. They comment on equipment organization. You know, if your pediatric bag has a, um, a, red, uh, a red lock tie on it and you only go in when you've got a kid once a month, or when you're inventorying the bag once a month, you may not be as familiar with the equipment. Glucose measurement is important in the altered patient. Remember, all these patients were altered, not seizing, and breathing okay-ish when they first arrived, and probably should have had glucose checks. Um, about half the crews actually did that. For drug administration, they pointed out that weight-based dosing is difficult enough and is even more complex in some protocols where there are different weight-based doses indicated whether you give a seizure med versus the IM or IV route, which can even further complicate uh, what you have to do. And then finally, there was in, uh, inappropriate CPR performed by some crews. In the scenarios as written, CPR was never indicated for any of the patients. Um, some crews failed to check a pulse and started CPR right away when they noticed the patient wasn't breathing. Other crews waited, and when the heart rate dropped below 100, then began chest compressions, which again would not be appropriate uh, for a six-month-old. There are some limitations. This was a single state. It was a simulation study. Um, the design was good, but not perfect. Um, and in the end, I don't think the actual numbers of how frequently different errors occurred are important. But instead, I think this gives us as EMS providers and EMS physicians an idea in general of some of the areas where improvement is possible and may be helpful. And it lets us step back and say, how would our own providers have done in these scenarios? Would they have known that 
X is the appropriate dose. How familiar are they with their equipment and whatnot? And I think um, that's the biggest value of the study of giving us a reference to evaluate our own, our own agencies. Again, critical pediatric cases are few and far between and at risk for skill deterioration. So we need to be mindful of that. This next study, it comes to us um, from the military. This is battle casualty survival with emergency tourniquet use to stop limb bleeding. It is a one-year study looking at the Iraq military experience. It looks at pre-hospital or ED tourniquet use. OR tourniquets were not included, and there were over 500 patients in the study with 862 tourniquets applied to 651 limbs. So some limbs got multiple, multiple tourniquets put on. And overall, this was a pretty sick population with an average initial heart rate of over 100, an INR of 1.6, and, and lots of blood needed in many of these patients. The indications they used in the military were to apply the tourniquet as soon as possible to stop potentially lethal external limb bleeding. And all soldiers got this sort of uh, PTLS-ish curriculum. And they used the standard exclusions of you really can't use prisoners and detainees um, uh, with, in these studies. They used tourniquets on them, but they couldn't use their data. I think there's two important um, take-home messages. The first is early tourniquet use. And the second, which is like 1A, um, would be doing it before shock sets in. So the survival rate uh, for patients who got a tourniquet placed quickly before arrival at the hospital and before shock came in um, was favorable. If you did it after shock had already set in, um, survival dropped precipitously. If you did it after the person arrived at the hospital, uh, survival also went down in a statistically significant manner. 10 patients presented during the study with isolated limb exsanguination, and they did not have tourniquets available. All 10 of them died. I think that's important. So adverse effects. Okay, we know the good news. We know that tourniquets are important for stopping bleeding in the right patient, but what about the wrong patient? What if your patient didn't need a tourniquet and you put a tourniquet on them instead? And I think this was a big part of the traditional fear associated with tourniquets, right? We know it's great if they're exsanguinating, but we don't want to put it on because we don't know if our patient actually meets criteria or not. We don't want to hurt them by putting a tourniquet on inappropriately. And I think this study says that's not a big concern. In this study, 16 of the 651 tourniquets applied had no indication. They were replaced with a pressure dressing and they had no morbidity associated with them, okay? And so I think the take home message is that tourniquets are life saving if needed and if not needed are generally not harmful. And again, um, these are not tourniquets that are put on and left for seven hours. These are tourniquets that are every step along the way reevaluated by the next provider to see if they can be taken off or not. Okay, spinal immobilization in penetrating trauma. Um, spinal immobilization is a topic near and dear to my heart. And this study called Spinal Immobilization in Penetrating Trauma, More Harm Than Good, comes to us from the Journal of Trauma. It was published in 2010, and, and since then, the, the landscape of spinal motion restriction has changed a lot. Um, but remember, for context, in 2010, um, it really was, in many areas, everybody needs a backboard, everybody needs head blocks, everybody needs seat collars. And I know my providers had traditionally been taught, if someone is shot in the torso, they need to be put on a backboard because you don't know where the bullet is going, and there may be an occult spine fracture or some occult badness. So the traditional teaching was they all need to be backboarded. The hypothesis of the study was that for victims of penetrating trauma, spinal immobilization offered minimal benefit, took time, and as such delayed arrival at the trauma center, and so therefore likely would increase mortality. This was another retrospective study of the American College of Surgeons National Trauma Data Bank. It looked at cases from 2001 to 2004 and looked at all trauma patients suffering uh, penetrating injury. They wanted to make sure that they were including cases where um, in the database procedures were not entered. So to enter the study, each case had to either specifically have no procedure documented or at least one procedure documented. If that space was just left blank, the case was excluded because they didn't want to introduce a bias in case nothing was recorded in that data set. 
They reviewed in-hospital mortality and other associated variables and did a multiple logistic regression taking these factors into account, including injury severity score, uh, race, age, gender, and others. Here's what they found. There were 45,000 patients who met inclusion criteria. Of them, only a small number, fortunately, 4.3% were immobilized. And the overall mortality was 8.1%. So this is a pretty sick group. They found that gunshot wound patients were more likely to be immobilized compared to other types of penetrating trauma, primarily uh, stabbings. They looked at this in terms of number needed to treat and number needed to harm. So they looked at patients with incomplete spinal injuries requiring an operative procedure, thinking that that potentially would be the group with a potential benefit. With that in mind, they found the number needed to treat was greater than 1,000. They then looked at the number needed to harm, the number of patients who would need to be immobilized to be associated statistically with one additional death. Remember, um, it was a 14.7% um, mortality rate for those immobilized versus 7.2 for those not immobilized. And this left them with a number needed to harm of 66. So number needed to treat 1,000, number needed to harm potentially 66. They found that spine immobilized patients were twice likely to die more likely to have ISS is greater than 15, which was partially accounted for in the regression, um, but may not have been perfect. Uh, more likely to have a complete injury and undergo spine surgery, and more likely to receive IV fluids, be intubated, and be splinted. So these were potentially sicker patients to begin with, but they definitely did die at a higher rate in the end. There was no subgroup that showed a benefit from spinal immobilization. So we think this was probably due, um, according to Dr. Reb's editorial in the same journal, that due to a waste of precious time, although the study itself does not take into account on-scene time. So that's just a theory. Um, if you were immobilized in the study, you were more than twice as likely to die. Again, that's association, not necessarily causation. Unstable spine injuries were rare in the setting of penetrating trauma. And again, no subgroup analysis showed any survival benefit. Okay, we're now going to move on to a pair of ITD studies, and we are now more than halfway home. This first study, standard cardiopulmonary resuscitation versus active compression-decompression cardiopulmonary resuscitation with augmentation of negative intrathoracic pressure for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, a randomized trial. We know that standard CPR provides less than a quarter of the normal blood flow to the patient, and it was thought that perhaps augmenting the negative interthoracic pressure during decompression may increase venous return and thus increase cardiac and cerebral uh, perfusion. If you don't know what an ITD is, this is an impedance threshold device. It is described in our next study as a device designed to enhance venous return and cardiac output during CPR by increasing the degree of negative interthoracic pressure. It does this by preventing passive inflow of air during the chest recoil phase using essentially a one-way valve. Now, it should be said this study was sponsored by the makers of the Rescue Pod and Rescue Pump, um, who were involved in the study process. <laughs> this was a large study. It was block randomized, a multi-center trial at seven sites, and it looked at non-traumatic cardiac arrest adult patients. The survival of the hospital discharge with favorable neurologic function, that would be a modified rank and score of equal or less than three was used as the key endpoint. So again, these are patients who are getting both the rescue pod, the ITD, and the rescue pump, which is sectionally, essentially is that suction cup that pulls the chest up during chest wall recall. So the control group was neither. The intervention group was both rescue pod and rescue pump. There were 1,200 total patients, and the study intervention group led to a 53% relative increase in survival to hospital discharge with an MRS of three or less. This is an odds ratio of 1.58. So it showed that if you got both those interventions, you were more likely to come back to life with a modified rank and score of less than or equal to three compared if you got neither of those interventions. And I think that's one of the key limitations of this study. Whenever you show a benefit from adding two or more interventions at once, 
it's hard to tell which of those interventions were at working. It's possible they both benefited. It's possible that there was a synergy between the two of them, but then it's also possible that only one of them had any real effect in this data. It should also be noted that compression rate in the study was done uh, based on a metronome at 80 um, compressions per minute, and providers were not blinded because they knew if they were using an ITD or not, they knew if they were using the suction unit or not. So the take home point the authors and studies um, group wants you to take from this is that active compression decompression CPR with the use of an ITD appears to have a benefit over CPR alone. And manipulating the inner thoracic pressure with these two devices may lead to better blood flow during CPR and potentially better outcomes. So we just talked about some of the problems with using two devices at once. What if you just use one of them? Uh, this is a rock study by the same first author as the, the last paper that is a trial of the impedance threshold device in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It was published in 2011 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was a randomized, double-blinded trial of an ITD in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And this one was real slick because not only did they only use um, one of the two procedures, just the ITD, they also blinded the rescuers. So rescuers either used a real ITD or a sham ITD, and they couldn't tell the difference. There were 9,000 patients in this study nearly, and the primary outcome was survival to hospital discharge, again, with a modified rank and score of less than three. And they excluded traumatic patients, sticking primarily with non-traumatic patients. If you were in jail, if you were pregnant, if you were burned, if you had mechanical CPR, you were similarly excluded. You were also excluded if your EMS response time was greater than 15 minutes. Um, I, I guess the thought was your likelihood of coming back after a prolonged downtime um, was much less. So let's look at survival to discharge with a modified ranking score of less than three. Um, in this case, actually, the sham group did slightly better in real numbers, but not there was no statistical difference between the two. The same was true for ROSC at ED arrival. Again, not a statistically significant difference. And for survival to hospital admission, also not statistically significant. Survival to hospital discharge was essentially identical, 8.20 in both groups, which does give you a p-value of 0.99. And in any of the a priori uh, subgroups, there was not uh, any real difference either. So what are some of the take-home points? There was no survival benefit to using the ITD alone in this study. Uh, no increase in any of these subgroups either. Although overall survival in both groups was better than expected initially. And, and that may point out the fact that, you know, maybe it's good to be in a study um, because your agency gets excited, trains on something, you have a bit of a Hawthorne effect. And, and we do see at times that when we study something very closely, both groups may potentially have higher survival rates than we expect because we're focusing on the entity as part of the study in a way that we weren't doing before. So if we know that one study shows that the pump and the ITD work potentially, and the second study shows that the um, ITD maybe doesn't work alone, doesn't this really beg us to do a plunger only study? Um, it's not nearly as sexy as the ITD, um, but that is potentially a question out there that is, would it be helpful to just use the pump and not the ITD? Um, Bentley Barbaro and Dan Spate authored this next study. This is chest compressions only um, by lay rescuers and survival from out of hospital cardiac arrest. This was in JAMA in late 2010. The background from the authors was that there is a 10% cardiac arrest survival when resuscitation is attempted. And in some areas, this figure may be generous, right? There's many systems that have significantly lower than that. We know that bystander CPR improves survival, but it's performed less than a third of a time. And so Arizona instituted a statewide initiative to treat, um, treat cardiac arrest by teaching citizens compression-only CPR, encouraging them to do something and ideally having that something be, do, be compressions only. The thought was, if you make lay rescuers task simpler, and you potentially remove the ick factor of mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, 
you make it citizens to provide chest compressions more often and more effectively. Their goals of their program were to increase the rate of any bystander intervention, increase the proportion of bystander chest compression only CPR, and, and those two things are good, but those are process measures, not outcome measures, right? And then finally, an outcome measure, increased cardiac arrest survival, because that's really what's more important. How you get there is perhaps secondary. They did a large prospective observational cohort analysis looking at cardiac arrests in Arizona from 2005 to 2009. Included in the study were adults greater than 18 with unwitnessed by EMS out of hospital cardiac arrest. So bystanders could witness it, but EMS could not. And they analyzed about 4,500 cases. They did have to specially train the EMTs and paramedics to understand what kind of CPR was being done by the bystanders when they arrived in order to classify it for purposes of the study. And here's the flow chart again. They looked at was bystander doing CPR or not when they arrived, and if they were, what kind were they doing? Were they doing conventional CPR with breaths and chest compressions, or were they doing chest compressions only? The results they found were that um, lay bystanders performed CPR in about a third of the cases, and over time there was slightly more of chest compression CPR compared to conventional CPR. They excluded cases where medical professionals were the bystanders. Medical professionals overwhelmingly were performing standard CPR as they were taught. Over time, between 2005 and 2009, they showed a progression where each year there was an increase in bystanders doing anything and also an increase in the proportion of those bystanders who were doing something doing chest compression only CPR. They showed an increase in survival from 3.7% to 9.8%. And survival in witnessed arrests with shockable rhythm from 10% to a pretty impressive 30%. Um, most cases were able to have follow-up, and there was a 4.2% uh, discharge rate among all comers with good neurologic outcomes. When you break it down based on what intervention from the bystanders these patients got, survival was lowest if you got no CPR. Higher than that if you got conventional CPR, and highest if you got chest compression only CPR. Uh, of course, there's this observational study. There's some risk of um, ascertainment bias. There's also a risk of, you know, if you were doing conventional CPR, maybe that's what you were taught five years ago, and you weren't up to date, you hadn't refreshed more recently, and maybe that's a proxy for something else, um, or maybe you're doing it just the way you learned on Rescue 911. Um, but these are pretty impressive numbers that really do support the idea of citizens um, just doing chest compression CPR in the hopes of improving cardiac arrest survival. Again, um, the take-home points that this study touts is that bystander CPR increased over time, as well as there was an increase in the likelihood of the CPR being done being chest compression only CPR. And there was a significant association with survival um, if you did chest compression only CPR compared to conventional CPR or no CPR at all. So you're doing CPR and now it's time to shock. And what should we be doing with CPR relative to analyzing the rhythm and delivering the shock? So this Ian Steele article looks at early versus late rhythm analysis in patients with out of hospital cardiac arrest. This is another rock study. You know, at the time, there were conflicting reports on what should you do. If you have an AED right away, should you analyze right away? Or should you do some CPR to theoretically prime the pump before hooking up the AED and getting ready to deliver the shock? The 2005 guidelines um, provided for two minutes of CPR prior to analyzing the rhythm. And that recommendation was walked back in 2010, uh, saying there's really no good evidence to support doing one thing or the other. So again, this was a rock study. It was conducted at 150 of the 260 uh, agencies. It was cluster randomized by agency and location. And a, the groups either got CPR of 30 to 60 seconds, which was the time it took essentially to hook up the AED, versus 180 seconds, a purposeful period of performing CPR prior to defibrillation. 
they had a number of exclusions, including kids, trauma, et cetera, et cetera. If the AED was used by citizens or by police prior to EMS arrival, the patients were also excluded. Here's what they found of the 1,000 patients in the analysis. There was no obvious difference between groups. In both settings, 5.8% of patients uh, were discharged with good neurologic functions, and none of the subgroups had any, uh, any specific uh, difference either. Of note, the study was initially designed to have a sample size of about 13,000 patients. However, the study uh, was stopped early when the Data Safety Monitoring Board determined that further recruitment was unlikely to show a difference in outcome when both had essentially the exact same survival rate. So the study was stopped early. In this study, 36% of patients did not have appropriate length of pre-hospital CPR performed. So there was perhaps a, a difference in what group they were intended to be in, and in the end, actually how much chest compressions they got. Um, but I, I think this shows that there is no um, real data to support saying you must do a long period of CPR first or you shouldn't do a C period of CPR first. I think in any case, it certainly makes sense to do chest compressions while you are getting ready to shock the patient. Um, I don't think we should be slowing down that process, but while you're getting the pads ready, you should be doing something, and that something should be CPR until you're ready. And so we've talked about chest compressions, we've talked about defibrillations, talked about ITDs. Next, let's talk about pre-hospital use of epinephrine. Uh, this is pre-hospital epinephrine use and survival among patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It's a prospective observational study of uh, areas of Japan over four years, and it was a registry of all out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. Again, you, um, they looked at all out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. They measured epinephrine if it was administered in the field, and this was only an adult study, and cases with missing data were excluded. As you can see, the vast majority of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients did not get epinephrine in this study. Um, epinephrine became a pre-hospital study and was sort of phased in during the course of the study. And so as you can see, administration started very low rates in the beginning study, 2005, and by 2008, it had increased to 8,000 during that year. From the study itself, too, it looks like almost like it was a med control option, like they needed physicians' permission to get epinephrine, which may have also decreased the number of cases where it was given. In this study, they found that uh, when pre-hospital ROS was used as an, out, an endpoint, it did favor epinephrine use. For one month survival, it was mixed. Uh, but one month neuro and tech survival actually favored no epi. And that also had a statistically significant p-value. When they uh, did propensity matching, the pre-hospital ROSC again favored epi and one month survival again favored no epi, as did survival with intact neuro outcomes. Some weaknesses of the study was a low baseline survival rate and a really low number of epinephrine cases, as we saw earlier. We don't have CPR quality data, this is a registry, and so we, we are limited in what we can glean from it, um, but in the end, it showed in this registry, epinephrine improved pre-hospital ROSC, um, but not long-term survival. Okay, two more to go, and then and we're almost done. Thanks for hanging in with us. This last, uh, next to last, penultimate study is endotracheal intubation versus supraglottic airway insertion in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. It is by Henry Wang. Uh, Dr. Wang was up in Buffalo a couple months ago, and I thanked him because I often... Um, present him to my providers as the Darth Vader of intubation. <laughs> and I, tell them, I love you guys. I want you to intubate. It's this mean Henry Wang guy who doesn't want you to intubate. And this is why you need to practice and make sure your skills are good. Um, so Dr. Wang doesn't take your tube away because I love you all. Um, he, he got a kick out of that. And I totally continue to do that to this day. So this was a secondary analysis from the Rock PrimeMed data looking at adult patients treated for non-traumatic out-of-hospital cardiac arrest receiving an out-of-hospital advanced airway. 
either endotracheal intubation or an alternate airway. And it compared patients who got a successful airway. And I think that's really important. We'll talk about that a little more later. So either a successful supraglottic airway or a successful supraglottic airway and endotracheal intubation, like one and then the other, unclear in what order, or successful endotracheal intubation only. Choice of airway at the provider's discretion because this was just a secondary analysis um, in the randomized control trial. They were um, randomized to other interventions, and this is what they happened to do with the airway while they were there. Procedural failures were excluded, and we'll, again, we'll talk about why this is important later on. Overall, they found the survival to hospital discharge with a modified Rankin score of less than or equal to three uh, was what they were focusing on. They also looked at 24-hour survival, a return spontaneous circulation, and other complications. Of the more than 10,000 patients, the majority had a successful endotracheal intubation in the end. They reported in many of the cases the type of supraglottic airway used, and they reported 85% successful attempts with one device. That doesn't mean first attempt success rate. That means it was successful ultimately with that device. Survival of hospital discharge was 4.7% for the endotracheal intubation success group and 3.9% for the supraglottic airway success group. And endotracheal intubation had an increased functional status on discharge and an increased risk of survival. Now here's the rub. The limitation of this observational study was, we know how the patient ended up. We know they successfully got a supraglottic airway or they successfully got an endotracheal tube airway. But we don't know how they got there. And let's look at this slide, for example. If you were successful the first time you tried to pass an endotracheal tube, you got it right in the airway the first time you were in the endotracheal intubation group. If you failed endotracheal intubation a couple times and then put a supraglottic airway in, then you were put in the supraglottic airway group, the same way as if you would put a supraglottic airway in correctly the first time. And, and you have to be worried that some of the um, mortality associated with the supraglottic airway group were patients who had missed endotracheal intubations and then truly went to a rescue airway at the end, which then tagged the case as a supraglottic airway group. If you had eight endotracheal intubation failures and had no supraglottic airway attempts at all, you were excluded from the data set because you had no successful airway and it was like almost the perfect crime. Because I think, I think that's so important because when we think about airways, maybe endotracheal intubation is better than supraglottic airways, but failures are really what we need to be worried about. And I don't think this study adequately takes a look at where all the failures are to inform what we do with our cardiac arrest management of patients. Take home points, patients who ended up with a successful endial tracheal tube intubation did better than patients who ended up with a successful supraglottic airway. But again, it's, it's all about how did we get there. Directly from the paper, in a secondary analysis, we observed higher survival among patients not receiving any successful airway placements. So, so maybe successful endotracheal tube is better than su successful SGA in the end, but maybe neither one is actually better than either of those. Something to think about. Okay, congratulations. You have made it with us to the last study. This is High Flow Oxygen in COPD by Austin et al. You know, we know that administration of high flow oxygen to normal, quote unquote, normal people leads to an increased minute ventilation and a decrease in end-tidal CO2. However, for patients with COPD hyperoxia, the opposite effect is seen. Minute ventilation goes down and end-tidal CO2 goes up. This is thought to be due to depression of um, uh, venodilators or perhaps a worsening of the ventilation perfusion mismatch within the lungs. So this was a randomized control trial with two arms. In one arm, they had providers titrate oxygen to a goal of saturations between 88% and 92%. In the other arm, it was just slap that non-rebreather high flow oxygen on. The paramedics were randomized, not the patients, 
So an individual patient, an individual paramedic was a high flow oxygen paramedic or a titrated oxygen paramedic. And then the patients they saw got that same treatment. The endpoints they looked at was pre-hospital and in-hospital mortality. And the inclusion criteria was patients 35 years or older with, and they didn't say shortness of breath, they say breathlessness, which I think is awesome, um, and a history or risk of COPD. This study was done from in Australia, where apparently they say breathlessness, which I think is great. They also did ABGs on all of these patients, and, and that to me seems like cruel and unusual punishment. Um, I try not to do many ABGs if I can at all help it. Here is the randomization flow chart, as you can see. Um, they had 30 control high flow paramedics and 32 active or titrate oxygen paramedics out there. Um, and this is how patients kind of moved down the subset. In the end, 214 patients with COPD were enrolled, but only 135 were treated per protocol appropriately based on what the paramedic caring for them was assigned to. The intention treat analysis showed no difference in mortality and potentially a number need to harm of 14. And there was no statistical difference in the per protocol analysis. A big issue with this study was poor adherence to protocol, right? Only 63% um, were actually following the protocol the way it was supposed to be. There was 35% of patients with a protocol violation, and the majority of patients with a protocol violation were in the titrate oxygen arm. Uh, about 56% of people in, were in the titrate oxygen arm didn't quite get it titrated. And we know that putting high flow oxygen is almost dogmatic in patients with difficulty breathing, um, but we may not be helping them with that, and we may actually be harming them. I'm not going to go into the ABG data um, because, again, I have issues with drawing ABGs, and the vast majority of patients didn't actually get an ABG immediately on arrival, and so that is, is probably not as helpful. The take-home points for the study, though, are that high flow oxygen is a mainstay, but it may not be the best for all of our patients. And titrate oxygen in acute situation may decrease mortality, but as this study showed, it may be difficult to get our providers on board with titrating oxygen um, to a particular SAT, especially in a patient whose saturation is reasonable, but who looks like they're in distress. <laughs> because intuitively, we want to put high flow oxygen on them that's kind of entrenched um, in, into our early training. Well, congratulations, you've made it through all 15 LLSA articles. Again, this was a, a really quick fly through them, and it's my hope that at least two or three of them have piqued your interest and will lead you to read the entire article. I think these are things that are important to know and understand as part of our um, body of EMS knowledge, and I think these are things that we can expect our providers to ask us about, or at least we should know about when we're at the bar in New Orleans. Uh, I invite you all to join us for the 2016 LSA in New Orleans in January. And uh, thank you all for your time. Great. Thank you, Brian. I, I was there for your 2014 presentation. I thought it was fantastic and enjoyed it again this time. So my only question was if you're doing it in 2016, you already answered that question. So you, you took my only question I had for you. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, so next month we have, uh, oh gosh, I am blanking what we're doing next month. We are uh, having Penn State come back again for another talk. Um, and uh, then we have uh, December, we have Thames. And January, we have uh, Dispatch from uh, David Cohn from Yale. So we're looking for 2017 presenters. If any of you have any burning desire to present or uh, know someone who has a good topic to present, please let us know. Um, otherwise, we'll make this uh, video available online on our YouTube, Facebook, and uh, web pages. And Brian, could you send me your slides? Would you mind if we share those online too? Absolutely. Okay. I'll get that done. And I want to thank Brian for uh, presenting today.